Hey everybody, this is Tom Salome of Device Talks. Welcome back to the Device Talks weekly podcast. We have a fantastic episode for you this week. Our uh, our main interview would be will be with Amat Tizel. He's the company group chairman and global head of J and J MedTech Innovation and R and D's program. So uh, we'll talk with him about his career, of course, but also uh, how things are, are moving forward in J and J. A lot of good engineering and R and D talk. Uh, before that, Chris Newmark and I had a chance to sit down with Bill Gruber, who was uh, CEO at Interlace and later Solace, and, and he's written a book called The Leadership Blueprint, A Guide for Building and Leading a High-Performing Team. So uh, it's a great book. It's available on Amazon. I'm recording this on Friday, uh, the end of January, January 26th. It's free today and free tomorrow. So if you want to download it quickly. But anyone who uh, who wants to be a CEO, who is a CEO, or who just wants to know how CEOs do what they do, I, I do highly recommend it. We'll talk about it at length in the interview. And finally, I want to thank the folks at Tekin. This episode is sponsored by Tekin's Technology Development Group, Emphasis. And a little later in the podcast, we'll hear from Kevin Dempsey. He's Senior Director of Business Development at Tekin's Technology Development Group, Emphasis. But now, this is where I normally rant on and on about all the great things that we have upcoming on uh, Device Talks. We will have our device first Device Talks Tuesdays of the year. It'll not be this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday, first Tuesday of February. But of course, May 1st and 2nd, the biggie, Device Talks Boston. And uh, absolutely thrilled to have Paul Grand of MedTech Innovator, both at Device Talks Boston and right here on this here recording. Paul, welcome to... Not, I guess it's the podcast. It's kind of the pod. It's the intro of the podcast. Welcome, Paul. Hey, thanks a lot, Tom. Great to be back. Great to have you here. And, and we've got big plans for you in Boston. Uh, MedTech Innovator will be taking over the big room where we do our keynotes for the majority of the day. Uh, we'll have pitches and, and VC panels and lots of other great content for folks who are building the next generation of MedTech companies. So, Paul, thank you so much for your help with Device Talks Boston. It's really great to work with you on that. Hey, we uh, we love working with you on Device Talks Boston. Last year's investor showcase that we did, the All Stars uh, showcase, as you coined it, um, which were graduates <laughs> of MedTech Innovator, um, was a big hit. Uh, and I know uh, the room you had us in was 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 a good sized room, but we had people waiting out in the hallway um, who just couldn't literally stand in there trying to peek through the door because it was standing room only and. Uh, we get the big room this year, so I'm very excited big for room. that because we're we're going to fill it. I expect you. I, I tell people, MedTech innovators like a goldfish. Like, just give them the space, and they'll they'll, they'll fill it. And they'll grow to that size. <laughs> so I've got I've got the highest hopes for Device Talks Boston. So, uh, but before we get to the MedTech Innovator All Stars at Device Talks Boston, you've got uh, you got some other things going on, a few other things going on, and a deadline coming up. So why don't you tell folks what the what's going on and what's the deadline? Sure. Thanks, Tom. So for everyone out there who doesn't know MedTech Innovator, for those of you who uh, haven't heard the whole story very quickly, MedTech Innovator is an accelerator, but we're not like most accelerators. We're more like the graduate school of accelerators. Um, we're where the companies that are already off the ground that have teams and, and at least prototypes, if not clinical stage products, sometimes even on the market. Um, these are companies that are the ones that are on the way and we, as the industry, want to make sure they succeed in reaching patients and with as much value as possible. Um, we do not want products that get approved and sit on a shelf. We do not want products that get approved and don't have clear value propositions and reimbursement um, strategies that will get these products purchased. Um, that's, that's a failure. We want to make sure these companies succeed. Mm -hmm. um, and so we run an accelerator that is heavily mentorship focused. Um, with a lot of large strategics, companies like J&J &J and Edwards Life Sciences and Olympus um, and many, many others, Zimmer Biomet and so on. We have all these great partners, uh, about 25 of them who work with different companies, you know, kind of as their coaches along the way. Um, and, uh, and then we also have about 500 other people who um, are involved in the process from all across the industry, every type of stakeholder you could imagine um, is involved at a customized level to make sure that these companies are getting exactly the support that they need. Um, it is a nonprofit in structure, so nobody has to pay to be part of MedTech Innovator except for the sponsors. Hmm. Um, the startups don't have to pay anything. 
And um, they get the opportunity to get visibility at about five of the large conferences throughout the year, including yours, including device talks, um, but also MedTech Strategist, the Wilson Sonsini Annual Medical Device Conference, um, the AdvaMed Annual Meeting is one of our biggest events. Um, and, uh, and additionally, they get the opportunity to be in front of investors, um, providers and customers and payers and FDA and all sorts of people throughout the year in the program. It's a super high visibility. Um, and uh, we have lots of statistics. I'll just share a couple for those of you out there again. Um, even if you know MedTech Innovator well, you may not know that if you look back at 2023, um, which was a tough year for funding, uh, a lot of people uh, you know, would tell you that, um, there was about $7 billion in total funding raised in the medtech sector in 2023, according to HSBC's report that just came out. Mm -hmm. And of that $7 billion, $2 billion went to graduates of MedTech Innovator. So you know, roughly 28% 28, 28 of all of the funding in the entire sector is going to graduates of MedTech Innovator. So it's a very, very strong group of companies. We've had 600 graduates at this point. This is an ecosystem you want to be part of is the point. So if you're a startup and you're out there and you're saying, wow, this is really interesting, or if you're a VC and you're out there and you're going, wow, that sounds really interesting. I, I never heard of that or I had no idea that these companies you know, were such a large part of the overall ecosystem. Um, I have a deadline for you, and that is January 31st. Um, that is next Wednesday. It's coming up. Um, or maybe this Wednesday, depending on when you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> the 31st is the operative date. Um, that is the deadline, the public deadline for application to MedTech Innovator 2024. So if you want to be showcased at a conference like Device Talks Boston, your ticket to getting in is MedTech Innovator. Same thing for the AdvaMed annual meeting, the MedTech conference. If you want to present there, MedTech Innovator is your path to get there. It doesn't cost you anything to do it, and you get huge visibility, you even get opportunities for things like a little over a million dollars in, in prizes. Um, there's all sorts of opportunities, you know, non-dilutive funding, um, access to investors, access to strategics, everything you could possibly want, including the greatest peer ecosystem there is in the business. So January 31st is the deadline. You just go to medtechinnovator.org. That's our website medtechinnovator.org slash apply, or just click the apply link, either one, and fill out the application. It takes an hour or so to fill in. If you've got a startup that you've ever pitched to an investor, you probably have everything you need to fill out the form. Mm -hmm. um, apply, and uh, and that's it. Then we, we have a road tour that starts in March that runs through May, where we'll be traveling to, we'll have a big event on the West Coast, where about 80 companies will present in Los Angeles in March. We'll have another event on the East Coast in D.C. where another 80 or so companies will present. And then we do a big one in Dublin, Ireland during the MedTech Strategist. So we see about 20 percent of the applicants, 200 companies or so will be invited to pitch to hundreds of investors and strategics and others. And then eventually then we down select to the final cohort, which would be about 60 companies this year. And the last thing I'll mention is that we also, in addition to having corporate mentorship and mentorship from across the industry, we have some new partnerships um, that have been really impactful over the last several years with some societies. Um, we have some that we haven't announced yet, and we have some that we have, the most recent being the American Heart Association. Um, we'll have a cohort of heart and brain health companies. So we'll have a cohort of five companies that they will be working with. And when I say they, I mean key opinion leaders from the American Heart Association will be working directly with our companies to help them on their market access plans and their strategies in general. Um, we'll have the same thing with the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, who will be working with a cohort of five companies in the plastic surgery space. Um, these are really exciting companies. We've seen tremendous companies in the trauma and other areas in the past. Um, who make it into that category. Uh, we also have a track with military-focused companies as well, um, sponsored by MTech. So lots of, lots of interesting um, specialty focuses, and we're going to be expanding that as well. So that's MedTech Innovator. MedTechInnovator.org slash apply, or just MedTechInnovator.org is the place to go apply by January 31st. Great. And we'll put, a, we'll put the link in the, in the show notes, but folks can obviously remember that pretty easily. And uh, yeah, folks, so January 31st, uh, it's now again January 26th. So if you're listening to this as we just put this out, 
uh, spend the weekend uh, getting those documents together. And uh, I've already gotten one email from an all-star who wants to present in Boston. I'll share that with you, Paul, but it's, it's a, I can vouch for MedTech Innovator. It's a, it's a supportive, nurturing environment. So uh, get yourself involved with that. Let yourself be known, let your story be heard and uh, register right away. So Paul, thanks for, uh, for spreading the word here on, on Device Talks. Hey, thanks for being a partner, Tom, and uh, such a great supporter of the MedTech ecosystem. Great. Let's get this podcast started. All right. You ready for this? Ready. Chris Newmarker, how are you, sir? Good. Doing well, Tom. Doing well. Enjoying our uh, April weather right now here in uh, in Minnesota. Like Good good coffee drinking weather as I look out of the fog and the, and the cold rains. So. so you don't have snow to complain about, but now you have to now you have to complain about fog. Yeah. You don't have to shovel fog, Chris. It's true, you know. Come on. There's no, you can't. <laughs> it's good. So speaking of Minnesota, uh, I just bought some tickets last week. I'll be going to... Uh, Go watch the, my son's Purdue Boilermakers, now my Purdue Boilermakers, take on your uh, your Golden Gophers in West Lafayette. Oh, my gosh. Going to be flying out there for a game, so I'm excited about that. I so, mean, I'm an Ohio State fan, gonna... so I mean, you just yeah, do, do whatever I, you want with the Gophers. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a humane man. I won't harm the Gophers. <laughs> yeah. We'll just – Zach Eady might thrash them mightily, but, uh, but I'll be kind. Yeah, no, but I, it's it's going to be a great time, and I'm looking forward to it. And uh, I'm, I'm happy to have a, as our guest, and it's it's a happy coincidence you're here. We have Bill Gruber, startup CEO, and now author of a, of a great book that I that I managed to read uh, just this week because that's when I found out about it called the Leadership Blueprint. And uh, Bill, first of all, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, thank you both very much. I really appreciate it. It's great to have you here. I'm looking forward to talking about this document. But uh, I wanted to mention that, and you may not remember this, we met at a, one of our MedTech Insight conference in Boston in 2007 or eight, and I had just had my son, and we were talking about having kids, and you gave me a great piece of advice about skiing and how if you go skiing with your kids, you kind of like, you're forced, they're forced to be with you a lot on the ski lifts, like the, you have just this time for all this, this accidental or, or, or incidental time together and really sort of builds a rapport. And I, I'm not a skier, so I never took your advice directly, but I've always kept that in mind and, and spending my weekends and spending time and trying to create opportunities just to sit and engage with my sons, partly because of the advice you gave. So I'm grateful for that. Thanks, Bill. What I, what I didn't say, Tom, is that uh, my son ultimately then decided to go to college at uh, University of Colorado Boulder, and now that's where he lives. So uh, there was a downside ah. to, to that uh, <laughs> lesson, and that is that uh, I had to pay out of state tuition and that ultimately uh, he spends uh, 60 days a year on the slopes. So. <laughs> there's a part two well maybe that parenting book there's is not in, in an offing but. yeah <laughs> you, you encourage well, my, them to go I, to states I, where there's reciprocity <laughs> you need reciprocity <laughs> similar experience i i uh, uh my son chose to go to purdue instead of uh, a school in the general new england area so uh, I guess I drove him away as well, even though he's not skiing. <laughs> I have to fly to him to see a basketball game, but uh, I like to think we're still pretty close. So, well, actually, anyway, it's it's been it's been advice that that stuck with me. And Chris, you still have the young ones, so yeah. Not you still have time to keep them in state for college. Yeah, there you don't go. let that opportunity or, go. At the very least, you know, like uh, they can they can walk around Madison, you know, and like look how great Wisconsin is, like. You know, they, <laughs> still four hours away you know but it's, it's great it's a good time four hours would be perfect four yeah. hours is great you can do four hours in a day if you want to 16 hours that's an entirely different yeah, story but anyway people have heard this story before but i hope my kids don't like listen to, to this about- but but you know hopefully uh you know if they want to pop in with the laundry <laughs> occasionally you know i guess we'll we'll let them in <laughs> Uh, well, well, Bill. Before we get into uh, into the leadership br- blueprint, uh, let's talk a bit about your your career. It is covered in the book as to how you came to be part of the med tech industry. You started at Procter and Gamble. What happened? That's next? correct. And uh, at the time, Boston Scientific hired a lot of Procter and Gamble folks. Uh, they wanted people with kind of the formalized sales training, and so. Um, 
So then I left and there were a bunch of people leaving Procter & Gamble at the time to become sales reps because uh, Boston Scientific was a very young company and growing and hiring uh, a lot of salespeople. And so they put us through all the medical uh, technology and uh you know, um, just general medical training, um, anatomy, physiology, all the rest of that stuff. And so um, after that, I spent a couple years in sales and then moved to, from the northwest part of the United States uh, out here to Boston and went into product marketing. I worked my way through marketing. Uh, I was at Boston Scientific for about 10 years and then left Boston Scientific um, to go start doing startup medical devices and um, mm -hmm. worked in um, a cerebral vascular space, uh, a spinal product space, uh, and then uh, became an entrepreneur in residence at Spray Venture Partners where we started Interlace Medical, uh, which was uh, a product for uh, removing fibroids from uh, women with abnormal uterine bleeding. And then uh, from then uh, took over a company that Spray had already been running called Solus Therapeutics and spent 10 years there uh, working through four uh, clinical trials to try to get that product to market. And unfortunately, um, we shut that company down because we were unable uh, after a product redesign to get the product uh, through a successful clinical trial with the endpoints FDA mandated and due in large part to uh, COVID. We started uh, the clinical trial when COVID hit and it was a quality of life trial. So that made things really difficult to ask people about quality of life uh, when they're sitting on the couch and uh, and ill and not going to work and not socializing. So in the end, um, after I shut that down, um, started reflecting on my career and all the great things that I had learned from all the fabulous bosses that I had had, but also the experimenting we did in, you know, the last several companies of uh, how great a team I had and how effective they were at working. And that really had me um, deciding to, to pen down some of these bits of advice, uh, because if I had had them earlier, I would have been so much more successful earlier. I think if someone um, had maybe tried to encapsulate um, these lessons that I had learned kind of late in my career. That's amazing. No, it, it, it very much reads uh, like a, 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 like you condensed a lot of information from a lot of different sources and kind of took out all the meat and put it on one plate for people to, 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 uh, to, to feast upon because it, it reads quickly. It, it reads clean. Yeah. And as I told you before I, we push record, uh, you know, I'm not a startup CEO, but I feel like if someone thrust it upon me, I at least this would be the first thing I'd go to like, all right, what do I do first? What do I do next? How do I build a team? How do I develop a process? Uh, and I, as a word guy, I particularly liked the, uh, the mission statement element where you really focused on not what companies are, but what they do or what they hope to accomplish. Um, it just, as we're, marketing products and trying to tell our story. I think it's really important just to say we don't, we, we it's important not to say we do this or we make these, but rather we want to accomplish this. That's so, right. Um, How are we helping others? Yeah, well done. Right. I mean, that was the yeah. big deal is if we all want to help others and it, it's not just medical device. I mean, it applies to everything in every business that if you focus on how you're helping others, the rest of the stuff will kind of take care of itself. But we tend to lose focus on the customer. A lot of times we as consumers all feel that way many times. Like, you know, we've been using a business for a while. We're like, boy, I think they've forgotten about us. They're acting differently, you know, focusing on the consumer. And if if the team remembers to focus on the consumer, a lot of right things will mm -hmm. happen. I mean, it says something that like the two largest medical device companies in the world, I mean, Medtronic and Johnson Johnson, they're both famous for having great mission statements. That, yes. You know, that I everyone knows. I mean, and, you know, I, I, I liked how you, you know, went through examples of all these great companies that have these like really good short statements on the, like, this is what, we're about yeah and then there's some really stinky ones in there where you're just you know they're head, <laughs> there's some head scratchers right so you're scratching your head like really was was you know who, who was in the room when they came up with these right i mean there are some of those of, of yeah. really notable companies right in my opinion again it's all my opinion i mean i'm sure some of those people think their mission statements are really terrific but the, the, you know it goes back to what tom said you know it's the, the key is not only having a great cause Right. But right. then everyone can rally around the cause. But if you have the right cause, it's really simple to, to then set up a group of objectives and key results, right? Goals and objectives, call it what you want, that 
allow you to start to create the plans to achieve that thing, that cause, right? Yeah. Whatever you're going to do. And so then it all trickles down from the top is if you have a great cause and then everyone has objectives and key results, their tasks, their day in, day out jobs, all focus on that. And they all know how it links. Right. And that was the key. Once people's jobs yeah. link to what the cause is, they recognize there's importance to why they're going to work every day. They don't just feel like they're banging a head against the wall wondering why the hematoma is not going away. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just it, that is we all want to work on something that's important and feel like we're contributing to the overall cause. Right, that's super important. So I think that's easy to find for us in the the metal for the for folks in the medical device industry. I guess I'll say us, but because Chris and I aren't making medical devices, we're talking about and writing about medical devices. Uh, but in your experience as a as a leader, and as someone who's been in startups and big companies, does that I imagine some people lose sight of that from time to time, and it needs to be reinforced and it needs to be restress the fact that they're working on these devices that can directly help people at some point it does just become a job for folks for some folks yeah i totally agree with that and you know i think um at at boston scientific um they really did that i mean there was we had a vena cava filter and we there was a group uh, in manufacturing down the road and um these people would they their uh, the manufacturers they were all done by hand and so they would they would sharpen the tips of these and they were all the people were previous um, jewelry manufacturers because it was so precise. But um, what management uh, had us do was they took the marketing people and brought them down for lunch. And we would teach the manufacturers, these people who were previous jewelry manufacturers sitting in there grinding hmm. these these hooks all day, every day on and what the device did what the underlying disease was that why we were putting it in the body, why this device protected their life from a pulmonary embolism. Right. And so it was, it was after that session, right. Where we're now teaching the people because otherwise they just go to work. They may not know what the device even does. They know they work on medical devices per se, but do the people who are on the manufacturing floor really know the impact and why the sharp they're sharpening all day every day is so important to saving someone's life? And once yeah. we get that, right, then we're starting to connect the dots. Now the people who are, you know, they understand their, their connection to the overall cause, right? That's super important. And the opposite side that if they aren't doing it correctly, I mean, this could end up in their grandma. Yeah. Well, okay. So let's talk about Boeing, right? So do you think, you know, you know, you look at what (laughs) Boeing's going through right now and, 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 you know, the quality issues they have uh, at Boeing and that goes back to a culture, right? I've read a lot. This is, you know, that that's happened over there after they had a lot of retirements during the pandemic and, and something got, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't know myself what happened over there, but what I've read at least is that there been there's been talk that, you know, some things got forgotten as a lot of people got Well retired. and people started focusing on profits and not on the customer, not on the goal, not on the cause, right? Yeah. When we lose focus of the cause, then the culture changes and that and and airlines probably ought to have a safety culture. The fascinating yeah. thing is that airlines and Boeing and airline manufacturers very similar to medical device, right? I mean, everything yeah. we do has quality. I mean, it. we have quality in the room for every meeting. Quality's always speaking up, right? And and quality wins. When you get into an argument, guess what? Quality's going to win, right? Because yeah. we go to jail, right? If, if, right? if we do stupid stuff, we go to jail in med devices, right? Mm-hmm. And so those are really easy decisions to make. But somehow, I don't know, somehow in the Boeing world, Profit started coming first and quality started coming long down the list, right? And so, again, we go back to connecting jobs, just like we did before. Everyone's job needs to be connected to the cause. And what's kind of sad is that, I mean, Boeing became set, has become such a dominant airplane manufacturer because in the past they were known for such great quality. Yeah, you could rely on their quality, right? And everybody was cr- proud of the quality. The employees were proud of the quality, right? We talk in the book a little bit about if you have a great cause, it works for your customers, it works for your employees, and it works for your shareholders, right? Funny how that all happens. And it's all one cause rather than a different cause for the shareholders than a different cause for the customers, right? Then mm-hmm. you get divergent causes and the whole thing becomes a quagmire. 
Yeah, exactly. So let, let's get into the the meat of the book. Uh, first of all, this is available on Amazon, right? So folks can go to Amazon. That's correct. Yeah, and it's free today, the twenty uh, sixth and the twenty seventh of January, twenty twenty four. So we're recording this on Friday, so it's free today on Friday and tomorrow on, on yep. Saturday, and uh, obviously available after that. I mean, it's worth it, for anyone who's interested in this. I can I can vouch for it. It's definitely worth it. So yep. you're you're starting a, a, a you're 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 able to go back in time and give this book to you before you start your first job uh, as CEO. Uh, what is what is the younger you, the new CEO? take first from this uh, or what should they take first from this book? What lesson? I think the, for, at least for me, a lot of other people, if I'm a, I mean, one of the big things that all of us face is kind of our first CEO job is this imposter syndrome. I certainly had it, which is okay. You now have the title of president and CEO and, you know, maybe it's a small company. It doesn't matter. That title certainly rattles around in your you know, in your brain. And so, um, Mm. you know, that imposter syndrome has us kind of clawing for, boy, I wish there was a map here. I wish, you know, as as you said, Tom, that boy, if if you were a brand new CEO, it'd sure be nice to have some guidance Um, because now I report to a board of directors and the board of directors, Mm -hmm. you know, is looking for direction from the CEO. They're not they're not there to just provide a bunch of direction to the CEO like a boss, you know, a direct supervisor might. Um, and so that's when, you know, any new manager, I think this book is really good for a new manager or a new CEO, right? Or a CEO or a manager who's struggling with a team they either inherited um, that's not performing highly um, or one that needs a shot in the arm or their performance has really suffered. Um, and I think that we're kind of all looking, is there is there another way to skin this cat? Is there another, are there other things I could be doing that if done and others have done them successfully, if I do these things, it gives me the best chance of success. Right. And that's what I really could have benefited from as a as a young manager. Uh, unfortunately, I was uh, I had to go get scar tissue um, and learn learn all of those things by making horrific mistakes and having my people look at me like, boy, are you nuts, guy? Um, but, you know, after a while, you start to get it and you're reading and sucking the words off the page of other books to try to figure out how other people are doing this so that um, you can put forth a team that trusts you um, and, and a plan that is successful and a team that really enjoys working together because they can accomplish amazing things, right? And so that, you know, if I go back in time, if I had this in front of me, I think I would have had a lot of shortcuts uh, and could have streamlined um, my success a bit. All right, we'll take a quick break from this conversation to bring in our sponsor, Tekin. I had the chance to speak with Kevin Dempsey, Kevin is Senior Director of Business Development at Tekin's Tech Development Group, Emphasis. Kevin, welcome to the podcast, and tell us, please, about Tekin's Technology Development Group, Emphasis. Thank you. Sure. So Tekin offers technology development for medical devices through our Emphasis Group in Boston. At Emphasis, we're focused on fundamental science-based technology development to enable breakthrough or truly innovative medical devices. TCAN was formed in 1980. We're headquartered just outside Zurich in Switzerland, and we have an annual revenue of around $1.2 billion. Being a Swiss company, we're very engineering focused, and as a result, TCAN is a leader in our area of specialization, which is highly complex lab automation, clinical diagnostics, and medical technology. Uh, TCAN offers a range of fully integrated solutions across the entire med tech and life science spectrum, from idea to implementation, including full contract design and manufacturing services to our manufacturing device clients through our California and Malaysia-based facilities. All right. Well, that's a great start. We'll bring Kevin Dempsey back a little later in the podcast. If you'd like to find out more information about Tekin's technology development group, Emphasis, go to Emphasis.com. And I'll spell that for you. It's E-M-P-H-Y-S-Y-S.com. Emphasis.com. You know, one you know, you know, just to talk a bit about that, you know, what you said about imposter syndrome. I mean, I've always thought that the, you know, the the best bosses, mo- I think, motivate their teams, you know, with with genuine 
praise, you know, especially in front of in front of others. But if you're an entrepreneur, there's no one around saying like, "Hey, good good job," you know. That was I, like I, that, you keep on doing that. I mean, how do you? How do you keep on motivating yourself? Do you have an imaginary boss who tells you, like, like good job, you, you keep on doing that? You know, what you? Well, so, you know, like the, there's a great line and uh, somebody had said that um, you have to be, you know, so good entrepreneurs are, um, you know, they're – at the wildly optimistic, right? Unrealistically optimistic, and at the same time, completely paranoid, right? Because uh, you have to be able to balance both of those and and have those rattling around in your brain um, in order to be successful. Because boards just don't show up. Uh, to, to your point, Chris, boards don't show up and say, "Hey, you're doing a great job. We're pretty much happy. We're pretty much happy with everything that's going on here, right?" I suspect because- it's more like, "Where's our money? <laughs> so, <laughs> Give us our money." <laughs> you know, the bo- boards are boards are outstanding if you have a great board boards you know are great sounding for lack of a term sounding boards to go you know make sure you're doing the right thing but you know the best the boards always ask you what keep you awake at you know what keeps you awake at night right and you're like i haven't yeah. slept since i started this thing <laughs> and so you know and then you know john mcdonough uh one of my favorite board members used to say uh i don't sleep at night bill until you don't sleep at night <laughs> right and so <laughs> so you know that goes back to what you say chris you're just always paranoid right i'm like doing the right thing because the feedback because the feedback uh is just not coming in on a daily basis right and it, it's one more reason why if you if you have a system if you're not just kind of grasping at straws and steering on the bounces and reacting to everything as opposed to having mm-hmm. a plan. Here's the plan on how we're going to manage ourselves. Here's the plan that we're all going to agree to. And we all agree on the cause at the first. So the plan's all going to support the cause. And then we're going to go show the board that we have a cause. They, we all agree on the cause. They invested. They wrote checks for the cause. And here's our plan to achieve the cause. And we have hedging built in, right? We have backup plans for all the critical path stuff, right? And if we execute like we say we are, we hire teammates that have the same culture that we do, we're going to win. Or at least we're going to give ourselves the best chance at winning, right? Because there's always COVID or something else that can knock you off, right? And and But at the same time, if we put our best foot forward and we have a good plan to do it, well then, okay, that's the best you can do, right? And and you know, then you, in all of these companies, it's you know you're going to get problems, right? It's just that's why when we go out and hire people for startup companies, we don't find we want we do not want problem finders. There are problems everywhere in these companies. We need problem <laughs> solvers, right? Just show up, grab a hose, everything's on fire, right? So you, we need people who are great problem solvers and decision makers. Right. That's if we could if, if all of us could fill our companies with problem solvers and decision makers, we win because because no one's showing up, dropping a prop, problem off at their boss's door and walking away. Right. Because that's a flaming pile of maneuver that no boss wants <laughs> to walk out and find. Right. And so in the end. Right. We want problem solvers and decision makers. So if we could set up a system and we could create a team that works really well under the parameters we mentioned in the book, right? That we end up with a team that starts to manage themselves. Managing gets really Mm -hmm. easy, right? It's almost like drafting, you know, like a NASCAR drafting uh, one car behind another or or cyclists draft behind each other. One of the things I noticed when we started in, in the program here is by running this, by the time we were, you know, well into these companies um, using this program, my, my job got so much easier. I'm sitting in staff meetings. These guys are all managing themselves. They're holding each other accountable, right? They're offering to help each other outside of their silo. Oh, I'll help you on that because that's part of the program. We're all going to lose if, if I don't help you with that. I have some ideas there, right? And that's when I'm noticing how do we bottle this and hand it out to all our friends? This is awesome, Right. And that's what great teams can do. And that's a high-performing team. And we can't forget, in med device, these, the people on the team, they're highly educated, right? It's not mm-hmm. – these people are really bright. Yeah. They are really achievement-oriented. They didn't get to these, these roles by just slouching. So they, you know, they need to, to understand the whole picture. You have to be super candid with these people. Right? And we talk a little bit – Transparency. About yes, absolutely, Chris. Transparency. I mean – 
in, in the companies that we ran, they knew how much money we had in the bank, when our cash out date was, right? What am I doing to raise the next round of capital, right? And if you yeah. do those things, right? You're being straight you, up with them and they'll be straight yeah, so, up with you. So, and Solus was a classic example of that, you know, and I, I don't really go into this that much in the book, but, you know, we, we were running low on cash and I, we, and, and it was a tough time to raise capital. It's always a tough time to raise capital. And we had come to the end of our capital and I found a new venture capital group that would give us $12 million, but they wouldn't give us $12 million unless a strategic invested. So I had to go out and find the strategic to invest. So I'm getting close. I'm running out of money, running out of money. I'm six <laughs> weeks away from being out of cash. And I tell the team, I still haven't, I, and, I, and I'm talking to the strategics, right? I tell the team, I have to lay you off. I'm going to give you all six months severance or six weeks severance, um, but I have to lay you off. And, and we've been, we've been using the program that, you know, that we have and the values and everything else we talk about in the book. And so I lay everybody off, but I hold the staff meeting still my, my company meeting every Monday at 9 a.m. And if they want to call in, they can call in. And if they go get other jobs, they get other jobs. I can't pay them beyond six weeks. So every Monday, I, I give them an update on how much cash I've raised, right? Or not, or who I've talked to, right? I'm just, to Chris, your point, I'm, I'm being as completely honest as I can. Yeah. And so it, it's, the, it's, you know, five days before Christmas, right? And, uh, and their severance runs out in five days, basically, oh six gosh. days. And, and then the company's done. And so, and I tell them, I, you know, the strategics having a corporate meeting, the CEO of the strategics is going to make a decision. And if they give us the 5 million, we're going to get 12 million more. We'll have 17 million. And, um, and so I get a phone call at four o'clock and the strategic says we're in. And I send an email out to the group and said, if you still want to come back to work, it starts on Monday. We, we basically uh, got the 17 million in and they all showed up for work on Monday. And so none of them went and got <laughs> wow, other good. jobs, right? And 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 when I look back, I say, well, why didn't anybody? I mean, they were gonna they were gonna be out of money, out of cash. Nobody went and got another job. And the reason was what Chris just said. It's because of the transparency. They were as connected to the cause mm-hmm. as I was. They knew all. Of, I had I had shared everything with them. They knew that I was working on their behalf, and they were still calling in. Now, I don't know. I'm sure they were interviewing. Yeah. They should have been interviewing. I would have been interviewing. Right. Right? Yeah. I'm like, what are you yeah, people what are doing? doing? Are you I told you I'm running out of money. Did I, <laughs> yeah. did, did I mention my imposter syndrome? Yeah. I don't know what I'm doing here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so in the end, they all come back to work, and it was like nothing had happened, right? I mean, everybody just cranked. That's amazing. In fact, three of those people wouldn't stop coming to work. They were on severance. They still showed up at every day and were working, right? And so – what I go back to is if you if you follow a system like this, the other thing that happens is this loyalty. People want the team to be successful. They want the company to be successful. They want they want the enterprise to work because they're so invested in it. Their work is connected to the cause. It all works, right? And so in that in that yeah. essence, that's when that's why, you know, as, as Tom says, that's why I want to write the I went to go write the book, because once you start to see those kinds of responses to a team, when you manage a team this way, as I discuss in the book, then you're like, whoa, there's some amazing things we can accomplish now because the commitment's there. Right. And we're sipping cash. We're not spending a lot of cash at all. I mean, we're throwing quarters around like manhole covers, right? I mean, it, everyone's doing a great job to try to uh, make sure that we're not spending a lot of cash. At the same time, we're trying to raise capital. When you empower people to that level, how do you handle it when they screw up? Ah, uh, so that yeah, it's a great that's a great question, yeah. Chris. So and yeah. and people are going to screw up. And here's right. the deal, right? What what you can't have is two smoking loafers in the front of your desk. Meaning you can't shoot them all, right? If they show up, <laughs> right? If, if if they show, no, you really yeah, can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's illegal. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah, it's like, no. you, you, say, well, yeah, you can't live with them and you can't shoot them. So. <laughs> You know, the one thing is if people are afraid to make mistakes, you are never going to take the risks necessary to be successful. 
time. You're just not. And so what you do need to have is people. And you won't have the time to handle it. Everybody's no. going to be like, is it okay if I do this? Is it okay? Like, yeah, you don't want them to be asking you for every. You, you want them yeah. to be doing things on their own. Exactly. But So what you do is you teach them to make good decisions, right? They'll, you know, take the pros, take the cons. Um, but the other thing is, and we talk about this in the, in the values section, right? We talk about hedging and. A classic is if you have enough hedges in built in, I'll give you an example of a hedge, but if you have enough hedges built in, um, you can have a fail and yet you've, you've still got a strap behind it. You still have a safety line behind it. So here's a classic example. In one of our companies, we're trying to make this hypotube um, and it's hard to find these hypotubes because our, 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 um, uh, our tolerances are so tight. And so, and traditionally, teams would be like, well, if we end six weeks lead time on the hypotube, we're going to go make the hypotube. And if, and it's 5,000 bucks. And if we get it wrong, then we got to go to another supplier and order, try to find another hypotubes, right? Um, and I said, okay, so here's how we're going to make decisions because these are critical path items, right? And, and the team knows, because to Chris's point, we're transparent that we're burning $25,000 a day. That's our burn rate. So every day we lose in this company costs us $25,000. So I would pay $24,999 not to lose a day off the schedule, right? That's how we have to think. We have to think that Mm -hmm. every day costs us $25,000, right? So what we say to the team is order them from two suppliers or order the same thing from three suppliers, knowing we're going to throw two in the garbage, right? If it's $5,000 for the hypo tube, right? And we order $15,000 worth of hypotube, but we're really guaranteed that one of the hypotubes is going to work out of those three suppliers and it costs us $15,000, yeah. right? That we don't lose one day, which would have cost us $25,000, right? That's harder in a big company. Big companies have a real tough time thinking that way, but small companies can think that way. And by having hedges in there, you don't, to Chris's point, the person doesn't show up for manufacturing and say, guess what? The hypotube doesn't work. They're all bent. They all have a curve, <laughs> right? Well, at least now you've got two other sets of hypotubes that are in the, in the building and you'd be like, okay, yeah. that one's gone. Let's go to the next one, right? So what in your culture, you need to make sure that you have programs in there to guarantee success. And for us, that was hedges. For other people, it might be other things, right? Redundancy. Interesting. Right. Even in a restaurant, you make sure that you don't just – if you normally have four waiters showing up, well, maybe you ought to have the fifth show up because you know someone's not going to make it. And you're going to provide really bad service with you know, with one less waiter, right? And so part yeah, of that good. is can, what can we be doing to make sure that we don't miss? And, and daily burn rate, daily cash burn, things like that. Those are all super important things that just are how we need to be changing. And that's what drives a culture of a company. And that all goes down into the book of values. You've got to have a set of values, which are also rules. It's just basically, what are the, how are the rules we're going to govern ourselves with? Yeah, We're going to play by this set of rules, right? Tr- com- like Chris says, complete transparency. Or the other one, Chris, it's a, just what you said. The one we had was we love bad news early. If something goes bad, yeah. right, we need to know as fast as we can. Why? Because we have options, right? We have money. The only thing we have in mm-hmm. small startups is time and money. That's it. And we try to use time or money to buy time if we can just by hedging, right? And so, yeah. you know, by by thinking that way of, of bad news early, don't let – if if things usually hide, people are too afraid to bring them to the forefront. By the time you learn about them, it costs so much more money and time to get back on track that you lose it. So to your point, if, if you love bad, yeah, so then you have somebody in an awful, you have somebody in an awful position because, you know, they were, you know, they they had to run along with the football and, you know, like, and <laughs> turn <Yeah. into> the, <laughs> got, got fumbled and got run the other way, you know, like, now, yeah. oh, what do you do? Yeah. yeah. Now what do you do? You know, it's so it, it, uh, our regulatory person, uh, Josh Reed was just awesome. Um, he would come in and he would say, uh, yeah, I, I got, I got some bad news. I, I know you hate bad news. And I'd be like, dude, you just got to say it. Right, just you got to unload. Right, I'm ready. <laughs> give it to me. Yeah, straight. give it to me straight because time's of the essence. Right, and 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 in the end, it always turned into a problem solving meeting. It was never a, a lay blame meeting. Right, it's always about trying mm-hmm. to find out what's the solution. We got to get back on this. It's twenty five thousand bucks a day. 
So the, the book, again, is called The Leadership Blueprint. It's a guide for building and leading a high-performing team. It's available on Amazon. Final question, Bill. We'll wrap it up real quick. Are CEOs born or are they made? Can can you have a book like this and have some, some scar tissue and become a great CEO or is it... Do they say that in the hospital? Like you just gave birth to a CEO? Like... <laughs> <laughs> Yay, we're going to have a CEO. <laughs> That's a great question. Tom. Well, I tell you what, I can't speak for others, but I can tell you this CEO was, was made. This CEO is not born. I, I, am, I am just a great product of the people who manage me, right? I mean, I had fabulous, fabulous managers, and I worked for awesome companies, Boston Scientific, Procter & Gamble, Interlay, Solis. You know, I worked – I was really, really fortunate. Um, but I also, you know – I, I, I really wanted to be successful. And so I was trying to pay attention and take notes along the way so that I could learn from as many people as possible um, so that I could get better doing it. And that was kind of what, what the result was with this book was, okay, take enough notes. This is what I figured out finally worked for me. And I hope it works for others. That's great. No, I'm sure it will. Uh, lots of uh, good, I think, insights on career development as well. So folks should definitely... Check it out again. It's free on Amazon today on Friday and tomorrow on Saturday. And as Tom said, I just think it's a nice, really just quick, like, you know, you just, you just need to get that advice, you know, especially if, you know, you find, you know, you find yourself running a company that you've started. Um, you know, and, and I like the fact too, that in the book, you, you, you know, list other books, mm -hmm. you know, that, that you found really helpful that, you know, if they want to delve deeper into subjects that, uh, you know, they can, they can keep on reading. Yeah. Great. And Bill, I, I feel like we're going to have to have you back because this has been a really fun conversation and, and it's not yeah. something we, we talk really a lot fun. about. So thanks for taking the time great. today. Great. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Had a lot of good laughs yeah, on a Friday. Exactly. This is awesome. All right, guys. Thanks. Take care. Yeah. Have a great weekend. <laughs> All right, well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Bill Gruber. Now I'd like to start the interview I did with Amat Tazel. He is company group chairman and global head of J&J &J MedTech's innovation and R&D. But first... I'd like to bring back our sponsor of this episode, Tekin. Once again, I am speaking with Kevin Dempsey. He is Senior Director of Business Development at Tekin's Technology Development Group Emphasis. So Kevin, please tell us, how does Tekin's Technology Development Group Emphasis work with medical device companies? Although Emphasis is very much focused on the fundamental science and engineering to enable new products, we're very outcome focused. We address each unique engagement with our clients by really trying to understand their real intent or the desired outcome. And more importantly, I suppose, by challenging their assumptions. So what do I mean by that? In many cases, a problem statement from a client can often include a solution. For example, a client might state that they want an RF-based device to deliver XYZ clinical outcome. The inclusion of a specific solution, in this case, directing us to use RF, can often significantly limit the world of possibilities. So by challenging their assumptions, we can often open the problem statement to a vast array of potential solutions, uh, many of which might be much better suited for the application and offer significant advantages over traditional or incumbent devices. Once a particular solution path has been identified, and qualified through our multi-physics simulation. Working prototypes are developed in a matter of weeks, not months or years, by combining emphasis suite of highly configurable electronic, mechanical, and control platforms. This approach allows us to retire technical risk extremely quickly and develop working prototypes to facilitate biological system characterization and testing. And once the feasibility studies have been completed successfully, Actual product concepts can be refined and documented for handoff to the next phase of the product life cycle. All right, Tekin sounds like a terrific partner for the medical device industry. Once again, we'll have Kevin Dempsey back a little later in the podcast. Please, if you'd like to find out more about Tekin's tech development group, Emphasis, go to Emphasis.com. And once again, that is spelled E-M-P-H-Y-S-Y-S.com. Well, I'm at Tizel. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you, Tom. Very happy to be here. 
Excited to talk about R and D at J and J. We're uh, we're big R and D fans here, and and always interested in the sort of the innovative process and and how it works, especially at a at a big industry leader like J and J. But before we get into that cool topic, I'd love to learn about your path into the medical device industry. What was the first thing that intrigued you about working with medical devices? Sure. So I was born and raised in Turkey. Did a classical engineering path early on in my education did chemical engineering bachelor's chemical engineering master's and during my master's i kind of gravitated towards something closer to healthcare i didn't really from a purpose standpoint maybe connect with what a chemical engineer usually does which is the oil industry the gas industry the plastics industry so i went to something different and when I was picking a PhD program in the US, I picked a program in UC Santa Barbara that had a lot of bioengineering projects, a lot of healthcare related projects. And I choose my PhD program and project to be something in healthcare. And that's how I did kind of shift from a classical chemical engineer into a more healthcare oriented education. And then from that point on, of course, I stayed in the industry. What was the appeal of the healthcare industry, the medtech industry? What uh, what drew you over from the chemical engineering side? I think probably the human connection, the interaction with humans. You know, I could have probably pursued MD career if I stayed in Turkey. And if it wasn't going to be a medical doctor, I think I wanted to be somewhere in healthcare because I grew up in a family where... Our close network had a lot of physicians. So in our household, we always had lots of physicians, lots of guests, close friends of my parents. So I always heard their stories and heard their kind of challenges. And from early on, it just was interesting for me. So I think that was the connection for me to switch. Interesting. I don't talk with a lot of folks who have a chemical engineering background who have moved into biomedical work. Does that education, that training, that understanding... How does that translate over to, I guess, what's essentially mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering? I imagine there's a lot of great things to draw from, but are there there things that you are there shortcomings that you had to overcome? What was that that yeah. move like? Yeah, no, interesting question. I mean, actually, if you look at now the universities which have graduate programs in chemical engineering, a lot of them are renaming themselves to chemical and bioengineering or oh, chemical and biomedical engineering. And the reason for that is that chemical engineering is a very broad engineering discipline. You learn a lot of things like thermodynamics, transport phenomena, fluid dynamics. And these are kind of essential tools that could be used in very, very broad industries. And that is why... If you look now at many universities, there are a lot of, I would say, medical healthcare related PhD projects and programs in chemical engineering departments. So I think it's very broad. When I was doing my PhD at UC Santa Barbara, I would have said probably 40 to 50 percent of my peers were doing a project, a program related to healthcare. And I guess the basis, again, is because chemical engineers are very broadly trained. I didn't know that. Well, that's good to know. So you went from that PhD program, you you were a senior scientist at Inamed, and then it looks like your, your move was over to Allergan. How did you come to move there? It looked as director of research and development. What was the appeal of the Allergan company? That's a company that's gone through a lot of changes, especially over the past uh, 10 years or so. Yes. I was acquired in to okay. Allergan. That'll do Allergan it. Allergan acquired <laughs> uh, Inamed. And, you know, one of the interesting aspects of that is that they were very interested in acquiring Inamed for the program and project that I was working on. And that was not a very, I would say, a high profile program at that point in Inamed. Inamed's uh, majority of sales at the time was coming from breast aesthetics and obesity intervention. But Allergan was really interested in acquiring their injectable aesthetics products to ensure that they can pair it with Botox Cosmetic. Even though the revenue of the Inamed's revenue on injectable aesthetics was low, the interest of Allergan to that program was very high. So that was a kind of interesting opportunity for me because when they acquired uh, Inamed, 
it enabled me to have a lot of visibility and access inside Allergan, you know, connecting, networking, and being part of that kind of brand of launching Allergan's aesthetic segment, which was a combination of dermal fillers and Botox cosmetic. And I had a, you know, an R&D role and a customer facing role for the dermal fillers. And that's how I kind of joined and stayed with Allergan for a total of another six years. Did you enjoy the aesthetics space? Does it have the same energy and feel? I mean, it's part, it's very much part of the medical device industry, but it's also a bit separate. Uh, the outcomes are a bit different. The clinical testing is a bit different. But did you enjoy your time there? Or I, you- I actually did. I mean, it's they're actually very highly regulated. Dermal injectables are class three devices. Mm, good point. Because they're long-term implants. And because they are elective procedures and they're aesthetics related, the risk benefit profile has to be very positive for regulators to approve them. So actually, you learn a lot about risk benefit when you are doing a class three product that is not life-saving. Because the, again, the bar is very, very high for the right reasons. So I really learned a lot, enjoyed it. Uh, the other aspect of that industry is it's a lot of cash pay from a physician standpoint. So it's just a very dynamic market, lots of innovation. I really enjoyed my time in Allergan. It was a great company to work for, enabled me to travel the world a lot because I had a very customer facing role. And just, you know, seeing that industry grow together with Botox Cosmetic was, I think, a very purposeful, helpful journey for me. That's great. Uh, that, that really flips my, my perspective around. I appreciate that. And you're right. The physicians are very highly engaged and very involved in the innovation, working closely with the startup. So exactly. it, it has a real energy. And then you went from there to Alcon, the vision space, which maybe if I look at it from the way you described aesthetics, it can almost be flipped around where... You obviously need to have clinical safety, but your uh, maybe the performance needn't be as high because you're restoring or correcting really terrible vision. Is it much different than aesthetics? Does it fall along the same lines? How do you- Absolutely. I mean, again, class three. So I first did intraocular lenses in Alcon, which are you know devices that you implant inside the eye during cataract surgery. Of course, it's a class three device again, long term implants. And if you make mistakes, the consequences are very high. I mean, it's vision. So, I mean, I gravitated towards Alcon for a couple of reasons. One, at the time, it was owned by Novartis. And I had a lot of respect towards Novartis, read a lot about it. And the second, during my interview process, my hiring manager said something that I still remember. And he said, you know, when I go home, he said, I can tell myself and my family that I made someone see better today. And um, that just kind of connected with me. And I'm like, okay, I want to be part of that. So I joined Alcon in 2013 as the head of R&D of Interocular Lenses, was part of a major innovation and sales turnaround with Alcon. And then my role broadened to be um, head of R&D of all surgical business for Alcon. And that is essentially any equipment that is used for cataract surgery, retinal surgery, glaucoma surgery. Uh, most consumers uh, know us with, uh, you know, LASIK, so corneal surgery. So anything that was not a contact lens and anything that was regulated either as an implant or as a capital equipment was my kind of responsibility, which was again an incredible opportunity because I learned a ton about capital equipment R&D, learned a lot about software as a medical device, the regulations, the security, connectivity. So it was a very interesting broadening of my expertise, starting from a chemical engineer that doesn't do those things. Mm, interesting. Uh, I love these different perspectives. And, and let's let's move then into your role at uh, Johnson and Johnson MedTech. You're the global head of innovation in R&D overseeing, obviously, several different businesses that exist within J&J MedTech. Curious, from your experiences prior and in, in now at J&J MedTech, are engineers and R&D groups at their base, are they the same, even if they're in different businesses? Is the energy the same? Is the approach the same? Or does every sort of MedTech business, the R&D department within that business, does every one of those have a different sort of feeling and approach? 
I think there are a lot of similarities and subtle differences, but I would say one of the major differences that I observed in my career is the engineering approach in companies that are located in the U.S. could have subtle differences and sometimes important differences than, for example, an engineering group that works in Europe or an engineering group that works in Asia. I mean, that's where I think the, the beauty of diversity comes in. You know, I always advocated that companies that I work for need to have presence in different parts of the world because you get a lot of diversity in thinking. I think it's probably education based, also some, you know, cultural uh, differences, but that differences in education and the culture of the country actually does bring important diversity. And I would rate it all as positive in how you do your job, how you innovate, how do you tackle problems? How do you tackle a hurdle that you saw during a development program? Different organization cultures uh, respond to it differently, but engineering skill sets generally are similar based on the product categories. I mean, I would say for capital equipment, obviously you need a lot of electrical engineers, you need a lot of software engineers, you need a lot of systems engineers, and that won't change. But perhaps how the system engineer kind of tackles a problem is different from company to company, but I would say more so from region to region. All right, and this will be our last visit with our episode sponsor, Teak. And once again, here I am with Kevin Dempsey. He's Senior Director of Business Development at Teakin's Technology Development Group Emphasis. Kevin, does Teakin have any news that you can share? We do, Tom. With the 2021 acquisition of Emphasis, who focus on technology development, Teakin now offers a differentiated full product lifecycle service from concept development based on actual needs and fundamental scientific principles through product design to full volume, FDA approved or 13485 manufacturing, either in the US or Southeast Asia. So I would say that the inclusion of emphasis to the TCAN group really differentiates our contract design and manufacturing offering by enabling companies that want to be industry leaders who are serious about improving patient outcomes rather than offering a Me Too product. Well, that is some exciting news, Kevin. Thanks for sharing it. Finally, Tekin's Technology Development Group Emphasis is working on a lot of interesting technologies, a lot of interesting projects in the medical device industry. What changes do you see happening and where are we, uh, where are we headed in the future? So two strong teams that I see with our clients who are developing innovative breakthrough medical devices are firstly, they're trying to develop medical products that deliver a real impact to patient outcomes through, for example, better control devices that result in less collateral damage, if I can say that, innovative new devices that enable treatments that were not previously possible, and more efficient devices that can achieve results in a significantly shorter treatment cycle. The second trend that I'm seeing is a trend towards products that improve surgeon comfort or ergonomics, that reduce fatigue, which ultimately has a positive impact on the patient outcome and leads to better economics for the healthcare providers. Add emphasis, we're optimistic about this future because we're solution agnostic. Each new problem brings new challenges. And our fundamental science-based approach is highly flexible and adaptive. So we're confident that we can continue to enable pioneers in the medical device sector through our highly collaborative fail fast discovery method. All right, Kevin. Well, thanks so much for joining us on a Device Talks weekly podcast. And thank you for Tekin for stepping up and sponsoring this episode and for sharing the story of Tekin's technology development group emphasis. If you'd like more information, go to its website, emphasis.com. And that's spelled E-M-P-H-Y-S-Y-S dot com. How did you come to, you, you joined Ethicon in 2020 and you assumed your, your current role about a year ago, November 2022. What was the thinking behind the move to, to Ethicon? Well, Ethicon is an iconic brand. So 
obviously I have known about Johnson and Johnson <laughs> You've uh, heard of it from before. <laughs> very early on my career. But if you are in the medical device industry, you know of Ethicon, mm-hmm, um, sure, because it is you know an iconic brand. So when I got the call to kind of put my hat in the mix to join J and J, it was for me not a tough decision <laughs> um, i'm like yes i would love to be able to lead uh, <laughs> ethicon r&d you know where where can i sign obviously it didn't happen that quick but so for me it was very exciting to be called and you know i interviewed and i was offered the role um still humbled about it and i joined you know during an interesting time i accepted the offer late march in 2020 I was just so, noticing that the timing, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, when we all thought we will only be, you know, in our homes for two weeks and the world will return to normal, that's the time I accepted it. So it was a very interesting transition because I, I accepted the role in late March, joined the company in June, uh, moved from Texas to New Jersey in June of 2020, you know, didn't fly with my family. We drove. So it was an interesting experience, but obviously Ethicon, for me, was an absolute easiest decision I made. And how were you able to assume a leadership position under those conditions? Were you able to meet your teams and, and meet people? Were people working from home? How do, how do you sort of yeah, get a sense I, of, a, yeah. of a group of people without actually having the intimate connections we're accustomed to? Correct. So there was there was a positive, and obviously I did not. The quick answer is uh, first few months. I did not meet anybody. It was Zoom. We had a very skeleton group going to our office, but it had to be, you had to have a very strong rationale, like you have to complete an experiment, for example. So obviously my role didn't qualify as business critical to go into the office. So first few months I was on Zoom. Clearly it was difficult to connect with people, But on the other flip side, it had an advantage too. And that is when you usually join a company, you spend a lot of time on the road. And what I had as advantage is that from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m., I could have meetings and meet people on Zoom. So my immersion was perhaps not ideal due to the timing of COVID. But on the other hand, I gained a lot of knowledge quicker than a regular standard joining a company. The human connection piece, of course, was impacted. But I had uh, great peer mentors when I joined J&J that really, really helped me integrate with the community as soon as, you know, towards the end of 2020, early 21, it started opening up. I had a lot of, you know, positive help from my peers. And I would think once you're able to actually meet your team and your folks who you have been Zooming with for so long, that first meeting is, it's almost a celebratory one. It's almost a, a yeah, good first step with to the, take. Yeah, with the important caveat that I would, I don't know if it happened to you, but if I met someone in Zoom, when I first meet them in person, <laughs> I wouldn't necessarily recognize them. Yeah, very true. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, they were like, hey, like we had like seven meetings. Like, uh, okay. Yes. I mean, I'm... I'm a people uh, person, so I like the human interaction. So being able to go at the time, I was Ethicon. So the first time I flew to Cincinnati, where we have a large presence, it was a very exciting time. I think I went there for the first time, if I remember, April 2021. And I still remember that trip. It was, you know, meeting a lot of people still, you know, if you remember, we were very distant, Mm -hmm. a lot of masks, but it was still a very exciting opportunity. That's amazing. So let's talk about your current role. You you took over November 2022, again, uh, company group chairman, global health and medtech innovation and R&D, taking over for Peter Shen. What are the first steps you take when you take on a, a position like this in terms of, I mean, this will be your, this is your operation, your entity to manage. You want to make sure it's operating as you think is the most optimal level. How do you go in and assess an opportunity like this, a large organization? Maybe you can give me a sense too as to, Actually, what do you oversee if it's groups of people who are overseen by others? How is your business that you're responsible for? How is that structured? Yeah, I mean, so I'm I'm responsible for the 
product development teams that's called engineering and scientific teams yeah responsible for our clinical and medical affairs teams and responsible for our regulatory affairs teams and obviously we have some operational teams as well but okay. in the simplest terms engineering and sciences medical clinical and regulatory affairs and public policy related to regulatory affairs would be my responsibility going back to your question one of the I think mistakes I've made early in my career is to try to make an impact too quick, too fast. In this case, I try to learn and listen about the businesses that I wasn't close to. And what I mean by that is that obviously, because I was in Ethicon for two years, I had a very strong understanding of how Ethicon worked, the Ethicon business. So for me, that was not an issue, but I need to learn a lot about our orthopedics business. I need to learn a lot about our interventional business, which is our Biosense Webster a business, mainly in terms of revenue, which is, you know, for treatment of atrial fibrillation, Seronovus. So for me, it was a lot of learning, technical learning, learning the products, learning the science learning how they work. There's lots of physiology knowledge that I had to learn how a heart, for example, works. So a lot of visits, myself and the leadership team, RDLT, we did a lot of you know travel to our R&D sites, getting to know the people, do product immersions, demos. So I would say my first four to six months was a lot of learning. And then, you know, you, you start forming your thoughts around what you see you need to do and how you can create impact. And, you know, in a company like J&J, it's big and broad. So you need to be able to have a group, a large coalition of individuals that you work together with to create impact. So you form your ideas, you talk to others, get their ideas incorporated. You try to kind of maximize the, the group's position uh, in an aligned way and then you go into the implementation of what you want to do and where are you in that process are you the implementation stage now or are you still uh, in the formulation yes strategy? i mean in in different aspects abs- absolutely in different stages but for example the medical device industry is is changing you know if you go back 15 20 years the medical device industry was a lot about implants and devices that will either help that implant be implanted or devices for a procedure now those things are here to stay and we have to be really good at them which we need to be we need to do that but then there is this additional piece of adding surgical guidance giving more information to the physician to make better decisions in the OR by collecting data, analyzing the data. So there's this digitization of surgery and digitization of medical device industry happening. So for us, for example, in the implementation phase, it could be how do we execute in the most successful way in our processes, our products, our talent strategy to be able to ensure we maximize our kind of potential in digitizing surgery. So for me, that will be an example of we formed a plan. And now as our, you know, R&D leadership team, we are executing that plan. And obviously, these are long term strategies, because, you know, we need to have a position on things like generative AI, we need to have a position on how do we develop software with, with a very, very broad portfolio. So lots of decisions, lots of planning, but that's that would be one example of an implementation. You're absolutely right. The medical device industry is changing in what the devices have to be able to do. And and I'm not sure if, j even maybe on the vision side, if you have any products that are patient-facing that you have to develop apps for and, and things like that, that people have to engage with, which introduces a whole new level of complexity. But how will R&D departments change in the future to accommodate all these new technologies. What is the next generation of, of talent for med tech sort of look like? Yeah, I think it's going to be an and versus an or. And what okay. I mean by that is early in the interview, you you mentioned mechanical engineering. There will always be a lot of need for great mechanical engineering. There will always be a lot of great need for polymer scientists, metal scientists, 
I think those are there to stay. They have been there for a very long time, those needs. They are here to stay. So I think if you have a career in mechanical engineering, a career in polymer science, I think we need you. The and piece is there is going to be, I think, more electrical engineering, software engineering, systems engineering, optical engineering. Those specialties are going to be needed more than the past because of what we just discussed, the digitization of surgery. So I think it's just going to broaden versus shift is how I see it. So is there an exchange of mechanical engineers for people with optical experience or is it the end as in you had 10 people before, now you're going to have 15 or perhaps 20 or 25 or are these departments going to grow? Yes. I mean, you know, we're very comfortable sharing, for example, our R&D investment. Our R&D investment grows faster than our sales in J&J, partially because of that. A mistake in the industry would be to say, okay, you know, the future is only digital. The future is only software engineering. And if you do that, you miss the core, which is what you put inside the body, for example. What's the implant? So I don't think it's a shift. I think it's an end. Hmm. And what is it that will bind all these engineers from different specialties? I imagine that the the mission of MedTech, the desire you stated up front to work in healthcare and to help in patients, that's that's sort of the unifying force that, again, binds all these, these folks with different specialties other than just working for the same company. But mission is so important and culture is so important. Oh, absolutely. I mean, in our R&D strategy, maybe I'll start there and try to come back to what you're saying. R&D strategy, for example, always starts with the unmet need. We don't go after, for example, financial targets in innovation. We start with the highest unmet need. And usually, if you have high unmet need, there's a positive growth story there as well. But that unmet need and solving that patient's unmet needs is the unifying purpose of engineers and scientists. Something that I think j j does really, really well is continuously bringing patients that have been positively impacted by the products we make into the building, connecting with the engineers, the scientists. And that purpose is always there. It's always in front of you. That makes, I think, that community come together. And, you know, all of us at J&J, our families use J&J products, our neighbors use J&J products. So, I don't think that has ever been a challenge for a J&J engineer and scientist to not connect with the purpose of J&J. And, you know, something that we're really, really proud of, which I didn't know much about before I came to J&J, is the credo. And the credo is also an important connector of all J&J employee. And I'm sure you had a chance to read our credo. The first part is about the patient. And I think that connection is always there. And our final question, this is where I, I'd love to get a bit of forecasting from you. I normally ask, give a five-year window, but this is a big question, so I'm going to give you a 10-year window. What does the medical device industry look like in 10 years in terms of the actual devices themselves? You you alluded to some new technologies that are becoming more and more essential at J&J, digital surgery and, and optical talents as such. But if we were to look at the medical device portfolio broadly as an industry 10 years from now, will it look drastically different than, than today or will it look very familiar but perhaps with some some really cool and essential bells and whistles applied onto it what what does the metal device industry look like 10 years from now i think it's going to be profoundly different many things are going to impact it but in the broad you know terminology the digital surgery will be there and i'll open up what i mean by that uh, there is enormous data that is generated in the or and as companies learn how to access that data in an ethical, secure way, that data is going to be utilized for better clinical outcomes because we're going to have enormous learnings about, for example, an electric physiology treatment from a specific patient. And in aggregate, when we look at 10,000 patients, we're going to be able to predict better clinical outcomes and design products for better clinical outcomes based on that enormous data generation. You know, Recently, uh, I learned that there's over a couple of billion images stored in different, you know, healthcare systems and hospitals, and that data is very valuable. We just need to find a way to 
use it in an ethical, secure, compliant way. So the data-driven decision-making is going to happen more and more, impacting clinical outcomes. The connected OR, where all the devices are talking to each other, and things like edge computing, recommending a clinical path to the surgeon during the process, during the procedure, I think that's going to be the most profound difference where the quality of healthcare you're getting is going to be at a higher equity because, you know, algorithms are going to make more recommendations to you versus just, you know, a patient getting treatment based on that specific skill set or approach of that position. So I think there's going to be a lot more health equity coming from technology. There's going to be a lot of connected OR-driven efficiency gains in healthcare. And all these equipment is going to work in harmony, all with the mindset of better outcomes by giving surgical guidance. And I think we're in very, very early stages of all of this. For example, there are some hospital systems where they're using generative AI models to predict sepsis. I think that's going to become more common where hospital systems will be able to kind of prioritize patients based on algorithms recommending that prioritization versus individual judgment. So I think technology and dig digital technology is going to be the biggest difference versus incremental improvements. Going back to your original point, did this for you, for someone who's been working with various technologies and, and bringing in different skill sets of engineering, this must be a very exciting time to for anyone to be a part of the medical device industry. If, if what you're foreseeing happens over the next 10 years, it's really going to be transformative. Absolutely. I mean, what we have done for patients and healthcare systems as the medical device industry has been remarkable over the last 100 plus years. But I think the next 10 years is going to be a completely different cycle of innovation where technology is going to make a huge difference. Fantastic. Well, well great thoughts. Appreciate your taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for joining us on the podcast. Thank you, Tom. And I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you again. Well, that is a wrap. This is a really huge episode. I think there's a lot of uh, great lessons in here, both from uh, Bill Gruber's interview and my talk with uh, Amit Tizel. So I hope you enjoyed this podcast episode. Thanks again to the fine folks at Tekin for sponsoring this episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. A few to-dos. Uh, number one, register for Device Talks Boston, which is happening on May 1st and 2nd at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center. Number two, take a look at our Device Talks Tuesdays episodes. We're going to start up again in February. Go to devicetalks.com for that. Number three, if you haven't already subscribed to the Device Talks Podcast Network, please do so you don't miss any future episodes of Device Talks or Intuitive Talks or Striker Talks or Abbott Talks or our new podcast with Edwards Life Sciences. Very excited to be rolling that out later this year. Included also in all of that in our network is Ortho Innovations Talks and uh, another neuro-oriented podcast. We'll have more details on that. So, so much going on here at Device Talks. I can't stand it. So please do uh, subscribe to the Device Talks Podcast Network. Also subscribe to the AI Meets Life Sci Podcast Network. You can catch those episodes, the first season anyway, on this podcast network, but we'll be moving that over to its own. And finally, so many of these interviews are also available on YouTube. Make sure you uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Device Talks. Uh, it'd be great to, uh, to have you as part of that. We're going to be putting some unique content on there, some excerpts, some other things. So uh, it's a great way to follow the metal device industry. Finally, uh, connect with all of us on LinkedIn. You can find me, Tom, S-A-L-E-M-I. You can find Chris Newmarker as in a new marker. Kayleen Brown, our managing editor, she's on there as well. And of course, please do follow Device Talks and Mass Device if you don't already do so. That's enough. I think I gave you enough. I could ask for a ranking and a, and a recommendation if you're feeling generous and you want to give us five stars and tell folks what you think, if it, as long as it's a good thing. Would love that. I don't usually ask that because I don't know what it generates, but uh, they do help the podcast. So if you're in a giving spirit, 
uh, please do uh, give us a ranking or rating on your uh, podcast player. That's it, folks. We'll have another episode of the Device Talks Weekly Podcast next week. It's another dandy, so don't miss out. Take care, everybody.